Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, joining us today on the podcast. We have uh, Chris from Empowered Gym. How do I know you, sir? We've known each other for a good few <laughs> years, right? Um, I'm going to say eight About eight years, years I reckon. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we. I think we met when you were reaching out for a coach. Mm -hmm. And I think all you really needed was some accountability, if I remember correctly, because you mm -hmm. knew what to do anyway. Was that? Oh, yeah. Well, that sounds, that's usually the way, it's often the way it goes. You were just like, someplace. tell me what to do. And then uh, I, I coached you for a little while and I think, and then you went off on your own way. And then during that time, I think we did a, a little video together mm -hmm. um, talking about fitness and mental health and mm -hmm. all that good stuff. Um, and now you come and train in the gym all the time, don't you? Well, because you have uh, the best gym in the world. It's Empowered Fitness. It's by Arrow Park in the Wirral. It's Empowered Fit Gym. Sorry, Empowered Fit Gym. Um, and I've, yeah, I've trained in a lot of different gyms and it's, uh, it's, it's my, uh, it's my favorite. It's the one, it's the one I always go back to. Tell us a bit about the gym, uh, its concept and how it developed. So I've been into fitness for as long as I can remember. I remember being like nine years old and trying to do a pull up in the climate, in the, on the climate frame. Mm -hmm. So it's always been about the gym and, you know, the, the idols like Arnold Schwarzenegger was a, a big factor to liking the gym in the first place. Mm. Um, then I was bullied when I was in school, so I wanted to be stronger and I used to do what, martial what arts. What were you bullied for? Um, I moved from Liverpool to Grantham, which is a- Wait a second, are you from Liverpool? Yeah. Fucking hell, we've got a, another scouter on this podcast. I thought you were a wool. I thought you were one of us. I've, Fuck I've, sake, lad. Where are you from in Liverpool? Uh, born in Fazakli. Parents. You're from Fazakh? <laughs> You're not fucking armed, Ter are you? Parents. <laughs> no, I've got certs on the way in. <laughs> racism. Anti-scout racism in action, folks. He, he wouldn't let me in. <laughs> you um, leave that shotty outside with the rest of them. <laughs> it's just learnt against the wall. <laughs> so, yeah, Fazakli born... Um, both my parents are from Crosby, so my dad still lives in Crosby. Mum's um, in um, Never uh, Neverton. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I then mum um, and dad split up mm -hmm. um, when I was very young, and we ended up um, moving to Grantham, which is a tiny town in um, or a tiny a tiny village in um, in the middle of nowhere near Lincoln. You know I was, was going to say, I, th I was going to I thought you were telling me the Grantham somewhere in Liverpool. I was like, no, 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 it's, no. it's not by Nottingham. Lincoln. That's why I've got this like news presenter accent. I was going to say, you don't sound which is a nothing accent, isn't it? Yeah. Um, funny enough, when I go on holiday, people are like, oh, you're from Liverpool. And I'm like, what? Yeah, you do, you do have, you do have a little bit of a scouse, but it's, I, I, that's why I thought you were from the world because yeah. you have that like the softer, soft. Scouse well, Liverpool has been, sorry, Will has been the main part, part of my adult life. So okay. since I was like 18. But you, but you would have first had a, a Lincoln accent when yeah, you were growing so up. Yeah, so I moved from Liverpool at eight years old mm. with a Scouse accent mm. to a countryside mm. and everyone bullied me effectively for that. Right. Um, and I was just too soft and I took too much shit and just standard like stuff that happens when you when you get bullied. How, um, how old were you when you moved to Lincoln? Sorry, were you Eight. Eight, yeah. Uh, left at 18. So I came back when I was 18. Okay. Um, so a gym was a big part of my life anyway mm. and I did martial arts when I was nine mm. um, I was absolutely obsessed with with karate I got my black belt in karate and then because mm. obviously you, you've done your martial what, arts what style of karate were you doing? Uh, Wadaru oh nice yeah so it was Very like nice. the, the fighting style yeah yeah um, at the same time we were doing all the martial arts so mm -hmm. we would we would go and travel for, to different clubs and kung fu and judo and did everything mm -hmm. it, was, it was great um, the real mixed martial arts proper yeah mm. <laughs> Um, so basically the gym was a, a foundation for strength and training and stuff yeah. like that. So I was doing it from a young age. Mm -hmm. Then when I was about 18, when I was about 17, I, I, I split up with a girl. Mm -hmm. Um, it was quite traumatic, um, cheating on me and, and whatever. And that sent me off on a, um, looking back sent me off on a bit of a spiral of you know feeling down and feeling mm. depressed and um i was out every day drinking so with my mates and we were just drinking like 10 types of 10 pints of beer and mm. I basically i got fat so that happened in about a year and then one day i was sitting in a hairdresser's and i was like 
what are all these chins all about? Mm-hmm. And I'd really put some weight on and I, I didn't notice because I was just... Her, her, sitting in the barbers is a brutal moment for anybody, is, isn't, isn't it? it? Where you look at your own face and you're like, fucking hell, I am minging. <laughs> <laughs> and that's basically what, what happened. Um, so then I started, uh, I ended up on the wheel. So yep. this is where I ended up on the wheel. Yeah. Started with my first proper business, which was a car wash. Um, the, I don't know if you remember the, the art car wash in Bromborough. Um, I don't remember the art car, car washing, but so you're, are you 18 now? I'm 18 now. I'm overweight. I'm yeah. not training. Yeah. I'm just starting, But you're an entrepreneur. Started my business. Yeah. Um, you get a loan to get it started up? Family or? loans. Family loan, yeah. Um, trusted with, with some money. Like a hand up. car wash or? Yeah, it was yeah. a, no, it was a rotary car wash. Rotary car so wash. You're in a car, you're in a, um, a franchise. Yeah. So basically started this, this car wash off. Yeah. Um, and then hairdresser came and looking in the hairdressers or the barbers yeah. and I'm like, oh my yeah. God, I need to lose weight. There's a gym yeah. across the road. Yeah. I've gone in the gym and I've started training to lose weight and to get some more strength and to build some more confidence. You literally went from the barber shop to the gym? Not literally, but <laughs> almost. the car wash was across the road from the gym. Oh, I see, I see. So I've literally gone, right, I'm going to start training again because yeah. I've always been into my training. Because so I was like, right, training, got in the gym and mm. started lifting weights and faffing around didn't really mm. know what I was doing mm. I'm, I'm I'm 18 19 years old mm. so as I'm really really inquisitive and really really um interested in how to do things and how to learn mm. and that was just in my nature so I was started asking all the PTs mm. buying all the magazines looking on the internet because that was in its uh, infancy at the time reading all the like posts and whatever, all the information I could find and being um, ADHD I've ended up being coming hyper focused into fitness okay so you, you you think you've got ADHD yeah so I got diagnosed with that in uni so I went to uni when I was 28 mm-hmm. whether it's a um, true diagnosis I don't know but whatever you did get a clinical diagnosis I got a clinical diagnosis you know most people who say they're ADHD it's like 90% of them are self-diagnosed yeah, yeah. Um, but you saw a doctor for it so I saw a doctor and I tried um, um, whatever the medication they put you on and I didn't like it whatever Ritalin Ritalin yeah Oh, just hand it over to me, mate. I'll do something with it. <laughs> These are just pre-workout. Yeah. Uh, so I'm. So I started obviously my my training, mm. hyper focused, and this hyper focus was a a two edged sword. So it made me become obsessed with all of the all of the information, and there's too much. Mm. And this information was coming at me, and I was like, "Whoa!" So I can't eat fats. Well, so I can't eat carbs, can't eat sugars. Mm-hmm. Wait, fruit has got um, sugars in it, so I can't mm-hmm. eat fruit. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what am I left with? Protein. Okay, so I'll just eat protein. Protein equals muscle. Okay, cool. So I'm just going to eat protein. And literally within months, I was down to um, tuna because it had no fat in it. <laughs> I had no carbs in it. Mm-hmm. Pickles because it was the lowest carb vegetable I could mm-hmm. find. Mm-hmm. Some salads occasionally. And it'll help you to poop out that tuna as well. Yeah. And literally <laughs> that was my life. And I was I would eat chicken breasts tuna occasionally. And it was ridiculous. Absolutely. <laughs> you should write a book, the tuna and pickle diet. It was absolutely ridiculous to the point where I was I was starving all the time. I'd l- I lost those weight, by the way. I got proper in shape. Yeah, yeah. Looking back, it was simply because I was in a calorie deficit all the time. And do you think you'd moved into, because of the ADHD, the bullying, a little bit of PTSD from that, you'd gone into sort of an eating disorder, like the uh, orthorexia? 100%. You'd think you'd gone into 100%. orthorexia, yeah? Um, Is it you, called orthorexia? You've got, you've got disordered eating and you've got eating disorder. Right. So you've got disordered eating when... An eating disorder is like a clinically diagnosed, mm. you know, you need to go and get proper help with it. Mm. If you've got eating disorder tendencies, mm. a lot of people can kind of work out, you know, come mm. out of them a little bit easier mm-hmm. by, you know, various aspects. I won't go into it too much. Mm. So I ended up Monday to Friday eating me tuna and my pickles and I was eating uh, cottage cheese as well, by the way. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, and then Friday would come. <laughs> you rock star. <laughs> <laughs> Friday would come or Saturday would come or a Tuesday night, whenever it was, that I'd I'd break mm. and I'd just demolish. I was, I was living with a friend at the time and I'd just demolish all of his food mm. in the house. I mean, a box of Cocoa Pops would go down mm. and it, my, 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 my mindset was going, I'll have this bowl of Cocoa Pops. It's all right, because tomorrow I'll just do a bit of an extra half an hour on a treadmill. Mm. And then I'd eat that and I'd go, oh, I'll have another box. Mm. And I'd eat that and I'd be like, another, sorry, another bowl. Mm. And I'd be like, 
So like tomorrow I'll do an hour on a treadmill and I'll do a I'll do a gym session as well. Another box. That had empty, so I'd, I'd eat his kids' food then. So I was on his the kids' cereals, mm. and I'd eat the kids' cereals. I don't know why cereal. It's probably because that was what was in the house and it was mm. easy accessible at the time. Mm. And I'd be absolutely stuffed to the brim, mm. and no matter what I put in my belly, I mm. still wanted more. Yeah. What's what's the hormone in that that kicks off in your body that tells your brain to eat? Is that is that gr- adrenaline? Is it- Gre- gr- grenolin? Gre- gren- grenolin, yeah. Grenolin, so, okay. So basically, um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, dyslexic as well. Um, so basically... You'll get away with it. <laughs> get away ADHD, with it. dyslexia. I, I, think it, I think it's grelin. I always think growlin, grelin. Grenolin, yeah. yeah. So um, basically, I'd dieted by eating nothing, mm. avoided foods, avoided everything, and then was binging. Mm. So this, oh, uh, this, this was, it was, it was horrendous. I was I was upset, I was crying, and I was in and out of emotion. Uh, my emotions were up and down all the time, and then I'd be back in the gym the next day, and I'd be trying to lift, and it was absolutely, it was one of the worst parts of my life. So that tra- that trauma, or that traumatic time, um, later down the line, I've then flipped into creating the gym. Mm. So as I was still learning about this, I realised that you've got, calorie balance and there was something called it if it fits your macros so mm. i started learning how to eat without needing to worry about what foods i would eat so i would still eat the cereal but i would i would measure it and then um i went i got that good at doing it i ended up getting in pretty good shape then mm. and then I, I did a natural bodybuilding competition where you you drug tested and went on stage and that's very very um uh, a very strange sport i'm never going to go back there again which bodybuilding or bodybuilding, natural, body, natural bodybuilding? all of the bodybuilding okay um it's a very strange sport. I still love it, but I'd never do it again. Mm. It's um, you're standing on stage and showing your body off and showing how well you've, um, how much how how much torture you've taken over the past six months by mm. starving yourself to mm-hmm. get ready for a show. And you know it comes with all kinds. And you've up, shaved yourself, put, shaved yourself, yourself, in a little put pants. yourself in a budgie smugglers, and I really want to see those photos. Man. <laughs> <laughs> Send them over to me afterwards. It's crazy. <laughs> Have you not seen them? Mate? I've not seen. I've not seen. What? Bodybuilding photos. Are, sh- you, are, you, are you happy for this to go on camera? Yes. It's not... Um, if, if you could show me and also hold it up to that camera that's in front of you, <laughs> that would be great. It's not... Um, Is it your screensaver? <laughs> not at all. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, that's really good. The, two, the 2014 one. Again, so I was... Could you, could you hold that up to the camera? Do you want to um, airdrop it, yeah? Could, would, would they be able to see that, Jacob? Yeah, yeah. Uh, drop it and we'll put it on screen. That's uh, that's incredible, really. That's incredible. So that's 2014. So that was, and that's was, n- you've got nothing. There's no gear, no, no HCG, no nothing. When I was on stage, there were some people that were absolutely massive, mm. and they were supposedly drug tested. Mm. Uh, I was drug tested, and whether it's true or not, I don't know. Mm. Um, but obviously, genetics plays a huge role in some of it as well. So my genetics were a bit crap, really. But my mindset was just like, I'm going to get this done and I'm going to get absolutely shredded. That's a, you're in, you're in uh, incredible shape there in the 2014 picture. When you say drug tested, though, I don't know enough about that to say. Are there ways around that? I mean, are there steroids I could take that I could take up until two weeks before the show and then... You plan on doing a show, yeah? Yeah, yeah defo. <laughs> I want to be there in my pants. Get your budgie, budgie smugglers I on. just want to force people to look at me half naked. That's what I want. Um, is so, there, is yeah, there anything you could know. do to, to hack it? I don't know. I, I believe so. I, I, I I'd be have, amazed I, if there wasn't. I should imagine there would be. I mean, it's, Anavar, do they... Do I don't that know. Sh- no. I think it's a, it's a, it's a piss test. And I think it's the, the checking for... I really thought you were going to say it's a piss take. <laughs> it's a, it is a piss take, but it's a piss, take, a piss test. And yeah. it's, um, I'm assuming they're just testing for the, the major majority of different steroids. Massive amounts of Trembolone. Yeah. <laughs> like, they're not I don't, They're not chest, testing your blood and they're not going to go, hmm, well, your LH levels are low, which means you've taken steroids in the last yeah. few months. They're not going to do all that. Okay. So it's, so it's... And there's a lie detector test. Everybody takes a lie no, detector test. No, the winners test. do. Oh, okay. That's interesting. So people who were the, obviously the winner is yeah. lie detector tested. And and everybody who you were competing with, they passed the lie detector test. Nobody had their trophies taken off them. There was a couple of times I heard of people getting, um, not passing, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so it, it is a thing. Mm. Um, uh, so anyway, the, 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 the point being was I became obsessed. Mm. Um, you have to be to compete yeah. and to get into that shape and that you're learn. in there. 
how to get like that was I just become absolutely obsessed and during that time I was still eating my cake and still eating my cereal and mm. just eating completely normal diet but the less of it so the yes. calories were tracked to an exact so macro so you're weighing all your meals all my foods mm. so that um, the combination of becoming disordered eating all uh, while I was during that 18, 19, 20 year old I was reading all of the training plans and I was trying to follow different ones and just jumping and cutting and, you know, I didn't really know what I was doing, but I was so obsessed with it and it, it hurt so badly. I learned as much as I could. What, what hurt? Uh, psychologically hurt so badly as in I was starving myself, mm. you know, going back to the pickles and the, and tuna. the tuna. I was um, not knowing what I was doing. I was going in the gym, like, like trying to, train and get as best I could but I was just like I had no energy or I'm, well, never, what, what sort of calorie allowance did you get down to to cut to that shape that you're there because you look like you're sub 10% body fat there. yeah um, okay so obviously when I was 18 was um, I don't know what I was eating mm. next to nothing yeah but when I was competing eh, I seem to remember hitting uh, 1800 calories yeah. something like that yeah and it's a gradual decline yeah like, so you so you went down from two two down to about eighteen. Yeah, I think I started on two eight, mm. and then I was just like gradually coming down and down and down. So I was aiming for a pound a week weight loss, which is on which average is really tough for a, for a guy your size, your shape. You're obviously in the gym all the time doing that. Eighteen hundred calories is yeah. that's the last be, few weeks. That's the last few weeks, but yeah. you are hungry twenty four seven. Oh yeah, but that was that was actually what that taught me mm. was resilience. It mm. taught me mental strength. It mm. taught me. Uh, how to just keep going regardless of how you feel. Mm. It taught me how to, you know, control my emotions and, and whatever. It taught me taught me a lot. And it was the, the resilience that I've brought into the entrepreneurial life. Mm. It was then the trauma, so to speak, of the disordered eating when I was younger that mm. then stayed with me for a little while. Well, the, well, trauma caused that. I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't be doing that if, if there wasn't an element of PTSD there. There yeah. was an element of trauma there, definitely. So then I've gone sold the businesses because I was just fed up with the particular business and I went traveling. So, yeah, sorry, uh, before you move past that, what happened with the car wash? I know that most franchise businesses struggle. Yeah. How did it, how did it go? Okay, so um, interestingly, the entrepreneur spirit was in me. Um, looking back, I, I didn't know at the time, but the, the itch to, to progress and have more was in me. Mm. And I would set up a mobile valeting business that would drive around with someone in it and make a nice. bit of money. And Smart. Then, the rain would it would rain off all the time, so mm -hmm. that didn't work. And then I would do um, I bought a set up of one of the first mobile tire vans on the Wirral. Mm -hmm. So it would be um, the mobile tire van would then drive around, uh, fit fit tires and mm -hmm. make quite a bit of money. And Smart. then it would come back, and I ended, and I ended up with a little unit doing tires. And then I partnered with a body shop, so the body shop would then do the paint work. And then mm -hmm. um, I had a guy doing dents and dent mm -hmm. removal and. Tin, window tinting and all this stuff was going on around me buying and selling cars I think I'd have about 10 cars at once and they, they were they were turning over so this entrepreneur spirit was in me with cars and I was like quite enjoying it because I love cars mm -hmm. and then one day I got a bit fed up and kind of sold everything made a bit of money put it in the bank and went travelling mm -hmm. so the how old were you then 27 26 27 mm -hmm. so I did it for quite a while mm -hmm. um the traveling was then basically me just having fun. Mm -hmm. So I went off and I was snowboarding mm -hmm. six months. Then I was in the sun partying mm -hmm. for six months. And then mm -hmm. I was snowboarding and partying for six months. And then I did that back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, really enjoyed the, the, I really enjoyed it. It was really great. Mm -hmm. it, like it, it, it aged me, so to speak. It, made, it, made it me aged you. Age, <laughs> aged me. <laughs> did you catch anything? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so basically I got a bit. <laughs> Not even months. <laughs> So basically, I got a bit. Um, I got a bit. Um, I enjoyed the, the, the traveling. Basically, <laughs> I could see you drifting off into your memories there. Yeah, You're trancing out a little bit. Where 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 did you travel? Uh, France, south of France, Malta. The, yeah. Um, Italy. Um, and I didn't really go outside of, outside of that. To be honest, where did you? Know. Where were you doing your snowboarding? Um, so I did Teen, um, Courchevel. Mm. Three valleys. Mm. Do you snowboard, ski? 
I've never done either. I, I used to I used to skateboard, and so I'm told I should you probably snowboard. try snowboarding. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. The, it's the best thing ever. Is it really? Yeah, it it's looks that, it looks cool. It's hard to learn. I think um, I, I I underestimate how much I've done it. So I think I've got like I don't know 200 uh, weeks of snowboarding under me. What? Because of how many how many weeks I did when I was traveling? Really? So three years. There's there's it's not a cheap sport either, is it? But when you're living there, yeah. You're living in a mountain. I've got a job in a bar at night time. Okay. I've got my accommodation paid for. Is it? Yeah. yeah I've yeah. got everything paid for and all I do is... That was because of the job you had working yeah. in the bar they gave you accommodation. So I'd finish, finish snowboarding at five. Yeah. Um, normally about half four, I'd get an hour workout in the gym mm. and then I'd quick That's shower, right. go yeah. to work and work six till like one in the morning yeah. and just repeat every single day and that was my life. It was That's great. That's awesome. So, there was, so you're working in a bar... You're snowboarding every day. Yeah. And then there's just tourists coming in every day. Yeah. You didn't catch anything. No. <laughs> <laughs> just some sweet air. <laughs> yeah. I just enjoyed just, just enjoyed the air. Uh, so so your 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 standard of snowboarding I, I know that like well, my sister lives in a surfing town, Encinitas, and I've I've seen her and other people over the years when I go back with the surfing that goes on there. And I think similarly, it's just one of those things. I don't think you can go away and just do it for two weeks and be good. I think you, right, yeah. you've got to have the access to it where you're just easy breezy just going out yeah. every day and getting used to what it is. It's like, um, I don't know, what you, on snowboard and you, you have a lead leg mm -hmm. like you do when you, you uh, roll a um, skateboard. skateboard. I'm goofy, yeah. So, you have a lead, so I'm goofy. So you mm -hmm. have a lead leg. Mm -hmm. Now, when you snowboard, you have a lead leg and you unless you dedicate some real time to mm -hmm. learn switch, yeah, like I'm talking, you know, two or three days of being absolute shite on your own, yeah. just trying to learn switch. Yeah. You can't progress much. And you oh, can't so you do have, that. You so can't you do that. snowboarding, you have to learn to do it both ways. Do yeah, you? to be oh, able okay. to do more tricks okay. and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So because of you live in there, you can dedicate a few days to that. So, you can, so you can learn switch. Mm. Um, and then you can do a 118, you can do 360s and you can mm. do jumps. And it doesn't matter which way you land then because yeah. you, you're, you're, used just, to you're used to it. So yeah. I, put, so I put some some good hours in and, and now when I go on holiday it's like it's it's great I'll just go down and yeah you can't think about anything other than just like it, it, the, the reason why I asked you about this particularly is the topic interests me because I used to teach martial arts and I used to try and push people outside of the western mindset of how do I fit this into a working week I only have two hours available a week to get good and I'd just be like but you're going to suck forever yeah and if you look at the Brazilians when they do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu yeah. they just go and roll and they just go for hours and hours on end and there isn't a beginning and an end necessary to the class you go to the training camp and you just roll and roll and roll with whoever you can then you stop for a bit you talk to your mates you go back to it same in Thailand the gym's open all day the gym's open from half five in the morning and you'll find lads in there at half ten at night but for the Muay Thai there's no we have the, how do I schedule this into my timetable yeah, mindset? Sure. And they just have the go and sort of mindlessly graft away at your skill set without concerning yourself with the outcome. And they get really good doing that. Yeah, interesting, yeah. One of the things I was doing when I was in the, um, in the summer seasons, I had to like do something because I was mm. all day I was, I was snowboarding and I mm. go to the sun and I'm like, well, I've got to lie around in the sun. Like, mm. I can't lie around. It's horrible if you have ADHD. I can't sit still. Mm. This is this is going to be hard sitting here for, Torture. for, yeah. an, hour, for an hour or two, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So I can't sit still for a long period of time. That's where like meditation's helped me a lot. Where mm. I'm able to like quiet my mind and be able to actually sit mm. for an hour on end, mm. which is a good thing. But anyway, the, um, the interestingly, what you just said is when I was in the summer season, I was working in bars mm. and I noticed that the higher paid jobs were where they were doing flare and you were mm -hmm. flowing the bottles around. Yeah. Um, and I thought, oh, I'll give a go at that. It looks cool. Mm. You know, you know, you've got something to do while you're on shift. You're not mm. just pouring bottles. Mm. So I was like, well, I'm going to start learning it. And I did the same, which was while I was on shift, I was doing the bits I knew. But then when mm. I wasn't on shift and I was on the beach, guess what I was doing? Mm. Standing throwing bottles around for no, with no end. Like yeah. I'll just do it for hour to an hour, an hour, an hour. And hour. you can relax like that. Yeah. Which is an indication of ADHD. Yeah. Like that's how you relax. Yeah. By doing a thing repetitively a thing, yeah. over and over again. And I got um I got pretty crazily good at it. Did you yeah? Yeah, crazily good. I'd throw the bottle over my shoulder spinning, land on my hand, wow. flip, flip, flip in the bottle. Yeah. In the in the shaker, do all this stuff behind my head, catches. I was doing a lot. It was really good. I used to work at the living room on Victoria <coughs> Street and they were world class competitors. I think they won one year for uh what do you call? Bar flare. 
bar flare for this flaring thing that that that, that you can do and uh, they were the same they would just work it the way I would see people in martial arts doing it with the nunchaku yeah. or whatever the weapon was, just over and over and so over I took, again. I took this. I took the similar mindset. I think for martial arts, right? So nunchucks, mm. similar to a bottle throw over your yeah. shoulder. Um, the movements were, you know, just fluid. Mm. Um, so it was it was similar in terms of what you would do in martial arts. So I mm. would I, we would train on a Sunday for sometimes eight hours, and mm. there wouldn't be any beginning or end you just turn up and train until you were right and then one you know then you know oh, i'm done now i'm gonna go home yeah and we just train all day sometimes gotta train you know four or five days a week doing martial arts mm -hmm. so it was like yeah it wouldn't i got to say i think the same man's mindset just came straight into yeah the um bar flare mm -hmm. so that was something that was interesting <clears throat> did it help you help you to get goals i think so probably did you catch anything no <laughs> I'm not gonna stop. <laughs> I just did, I just enjoyed the sun. <laughs> that, listen, I've done. I was doing door work in Tenerife and in, in New Zealand. I know what I was enjoying. The sun translates to. I know what that means. Oh, that's what I tell my mum. I was just enjoying the sun. Yeah. I just made some friends, mother. It was nice. I was a good boy. <laughs> exactly. Where were we? Hang on. This is going to make a terrible noise. Sorry, Jacob. This vape, this vape crackles. Normally they don't. This one crackles. Pot. I know. <laughs> Sounds like so, it's wrecking your voice as well. <laughs> yeah, it's crispy. <laughs> I'll come back sounding like the devil. So, what age are you now at the time period that we're talking? Um, so 28-ish, mm. traveling. Mm. Um, I think I came, I had a... I had a my brother rang me up. My brother's a doctor. Mm. He was just going through his training at the time. Mm. He's a consultant now, but he was going through his training. He rings me up and back then you had your, your little button phone. Mm -hmm. And if you paid £10 a month to O2, I think it was, you could receive calls for free. Mm -hmm. So I could receive calls in France and me and my brother would sit. And I'd, in fact, I had a driving job. The last job I had was a driving back and from, from back and to from the airport, like a, oh, yeah. like a chauffeur. Yeah. So there's loads of time to sit and do nothing. And mm. this is the first time I've ever done this in my life. Is this you're driving through like the French Alps to yeah. go and pick? Oh, that's nice. So by the time you've done it 10 times, you don't have to think. You're just sitting there driving your van. Mm. That little Mercedes with TVs and all that mm. in there and just mm. driving back and forth. My brother rings me up one day. I'm on the phone to him and he's like, oh, he's like, so um, how you, how's your day and whatever? And, I, and he was like, what's your goals? And I was like, um, well, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to land a 360 at the moment on my snowboard. Mm. And he's like, no, 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 what's your goals? Like your life goals? Mm -hmm. I was like, what? What do you mean goals? Mm -hmm. I didn't, goals. And he was like, yeah, what, what, what are you got? What's your five year plan? Five year plan? I'm thinking mm -hmm. about tomorrow I'm going snowboarding. Yeah. And basically I was in a mindset of what I'm doing later and what I'm doing tomorrow. Yeah. And I didn't give a shite what was going on in the next few years. Yeah. I had enough money in the bank. I was being fed, mm -hmm. you know, I had somewhere to sleep. Mm -hmm. That was it, it was sound. So my brother's like, no, what do you want kids? Like, you know, do you want a perm do you want a permanent girlfriend? Like, do you want to mm. settle down? I was like, Well, yeah. But mm. he was like, How are you gonna do that when you're just going traveling around the, the Europe? And I was like, uh, yeah, you know, tell him to fuck off type thing. Yeah. So when the phone's gone down, the next two or three journeys, my mind started going, Well, it started playing on my mind, what am I gonna do? Mm. And this is where the, the the beginning of my kind of personal development or you know, goal setting and, and, and started to like begin. Mm. And I was like, so what am I going to do? And this is where the bodybuilding come in. Right. So I was like, well, I go to the gym all the time. Mm. I love it. I'm going to mm. do a bodybuilding competition. I wonder if you can do natural because I don't take any steroids. Started mm. Googling, found that you could. Okay, mm. I'm going to do that. There's one. Okay, so what do we do about that then? Started learning a bit more. Mm. Then it was, um, I'm going to do a business. What is the business? Um, and if I'm going to do a business, I need to learn more. Mm. And then I think Audible had just come out. Mm -hmm. So I started listening to audiobook, audio books, but you had to download it onto your phone mm. and then listen to it that way. So I started listening back then into to audio books and a lot of them would be business books, mm. personal development books and, 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 you know, trying to improve a mindset, improve business knowledge. And, and then, um, one day it comes to me while I was away, it's going to be a gym mm. and it's going to be an absolute massive, massive gym. And it's going to be phenomenal. Mm. how am I going to do that? So I was stuck in this moment of like, well, I'm not, I know I'm not clever enough. 
I'm just a season here traveling around. Mm. So how am I going to do that? What's a, what's a season here? Season here is when you follow the seasons. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. Um, sun. Yeah. Winter. Yeah. You must have made, uh, sorry to track back, you must have put aside quite a bit of money to to afford that lifestyle. No, not no? at all. Because when you're working, um, is what I said before, you get your hotel, you get your, not your hotel, you get your apartment paid for, you get yeah. your wages. Okay. So basically, I think, I remember in one job, I was getting 1,500 pounds, 1,500 euro a month, but I had mm. nothing to spend it on. Drinks wow. were free, food was free. Really? So my money was actually going up in my life. Yeah, yeah. But I'm just not i'm just chilling and you might be selling some young ones right now on this on this lifestyle it sounds pretty good i would definitely go and do a a season if you are really if you're thinking about it if you're you're in snowboarding if if you it's a definitely a good idea yeah it's it's not it's fun but it's also good to experience the world yes to go and travel see other cultures um while i was in france i learned french good Mm. enough to work behind the bar in Mm. speaking french the whole Mm. time Mm-hmm. Um, when I was in Italy, I, I learned Italy, Italian just enough to be able to speak Italian. I wasn't having full conversations, but I mm-hmm. could work. Um, so all them things help you become more cultured and see what's more going on. It's dead in, you travel, you, you know what mm-hmm. I'm talking about. It's mm-hmm. dead important. Um, you think it's important for, for a young person or you think it's important for everybody that they do some sort you, of traveling? I, I think a young person, yeah. Yeah. Bef- if you can do it before you decide or help you decide what you're going to do. So yeah. for me, it was helping me decide what I was going to do because it was, sure. you know, loads of fun and, and time away from um, everybody else in my life. Mm. Um, but importantly, uh, you weren't just having fun. You were actually grafting. You were working as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah definitely. So where were we? The gym. The fo- Well, the bodybuilding no, and so the dream the, of the gym. So the dream of the gym came while I was away. Yeah. Um. So then I was started trying to goal set on how do I learn about enough to be able to do a gym. And that's where the my ADHD hyper focus came back in. Yeah. And I just started becoming absolutely obsessed with business, absolutely obsessed with, you know, everything that could possibly help me make an amazing gym. Mm. Um so this is back when I'm twenty eight. So there was this and then I, one of the things was, okay, so I need to go and do a degree. Mm. When I did a degree in business, so I flew back home, mm. signed up for a degree, managed to get on the course, did a degree in business. Um, started a degree and I was like, oh, like, um, like, what do you call it when you land? You start running. You just, I was straight in. Right. I was obsessed with it, learned as much as I could. Where, where were you studying at? John Moore's. Good university. At the same time, I was doing every course I could possibly do outside of it, every, yep. every seminar, every workshop. Yeah. Um, I oh, would total overkill. Yeah, mm. I would nail an audio book a week. Every time I was walking to and from uni, I mm. had an audio book on, um, and then I just I just didn't stop mm. learning, and mm. that was my main focus. And then basically, the 2017, I finished uni. Mm. Um, somehow managed to scrape a two one. Don't know how I did that. Yeah, but I managed to. But you you say you scraped it because you weren't you weren't doing the exams just, you weren't studying. Or? I just wasn't. I just was not clever enough. It was hard because I'm dyslexic as well. Okay, I've got to write this stuff. Yeah, I've got to read books. Yeah, and then you have a pile of textbooks like this, and I was yeah. just like, I need to problem solve this. I cannot read them textbooks. That would take me really. That would take me two or three years to read these textbooks. So I need to figure and uh, figure out how to do this degree and get the marks. Yeah, knowing that I can't read properly and write properly so okay. a lot of it was problem solving do you do you still think that you're not clever enough no not okay now. okay okay th- this is what i did for five years of my life was help people get through get two degrees and get through degrees and over time you develop a sense of through uh, the rate at which people can speak and which they can process information and what they do mm. of the sort of a sense of their like functioning iq okay. and i would be astounded if you were not smart enough to get through a degree <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, I mean, if you said, I'm going to go to Oxford and I'm going to study French at Oxford. I'm going to do another degree, you mean? Right. I would say that's, you know, for, for all of us, that's, that's going to be, that's going to be tough. Yeah. That's, but like, uh, the baseline sort of a business degree, yeah. a John Moores or something, um, I would be, I'd, like, if you came to him and was like, I can't finish this degree, I'd, I would be really, really shocked. Yeah. So do you, do you think that that's... It's the reading issue that's the problem. It's actually sitting there reading books. It's the, yeah, consuming written text. So 
It, it were you was, smacked as a kid whilst you were reading a book? Is there an association here between book reading? Maybe and- it was. It was possibly it was a school a school issue. Maybe. Yeah. Um, I remember being shouted at in school for not being able to read. And it's for like, being a slow reader. Yeah. So it then, became like a traumatic yeah, association. Yeah, so I do remember being in school and, and you know, you're sitting there, everyone's reading mm. and you take it in turns and I mm. would be sweating coming to me and I would mm. try and, I would try and read ahead so mm. I could get at least two sentences out without stopping. Yeah. So I'd be reading ahead and it got to me and I'd be like, uh, and then I'd get to a word. I didn't know that I was dyslexic when I was in school. I sure. only found out when I was in uni. On my first assignment. And, and at that age that you would have been, it probably, it was known, but it wasn't that well known, was it? No, I, th- I don't know. Were you in the 90s that I you were was, talking? I left school in 2000. Okay, yeah, So yeah, I yeah. was, so that was my, my when yeah. I was 16, I was 2000. Yeah. It was in 2000. The knowledge of dyslexia and ADHD, it's ex- it, well, it exploded after yeah. 2000. Because I think, um, so when I got, when I was in uni, they did it, I went for a full, like, half a day, like, um, diagnosis mm. and he had me reading he had me mm. doing problem solving tasks and mm. my problem solving was like off the scale but mm. my reading level was like young and i was like right. what and basically and how, how old how old were you when you got that feedback 28 okay so he goes to me um he said at the end of it he said you're seeing patterns you're not reading okay i was like what do you mean he said you're seeing the outline of the text yeah. as a pattern and you're not yeah. seeing the letters in the middle right he said, so you see a word and you, you kind of know what it is without reading it. Okay. So you've built up enough, you're intelligent enough to build up enough vocabulary patterns mm. that you can read, but you're not putting the words together. Yes. So when you come across a word you've never seen before, you've got no idea what it says. Mm. Like, and he was showing me this, 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 this writing of like crazy words you never say in, in, in day-to-day life. I had no idea what he said. I was trying to decipher them and so that so so from what you've just told me, I'm going to make an educated guess. You could speak French, but you couldn't read it. Oh yeah. So you couldn't read a ten with French instructions. No. But if somebody read it out to you conversationally, I'd be fine. You would be okay yeah. with with your French. Yeah. Weirdly, French. I just consumed French. Like I learned it so quick. Did you really? Oh yeah. Unbelievably I, quick. I studied French. I, I I could speak Portuguese, some Cantonese, yeah. Spanish, French. I I studied. I hate. So <laughs> I really it's the, I, with I, had French. A, I had audio tech cassettes on audio yeah. things on yeah. right and it was like the game was like learning it yeah so i knew all of the audio off by heart and what it right. meant and then i realized that it was just all patterns okay. so it was just like oh you put that bit with that yeah. it doesn't really matter if you don't it doesn't make sense as long as you get it over the fence and they understand mm. um but you can add hand gestures to it and you know point in and mm. you know can you well, pass can you pass me that thing you'd say thing a lot rather than the, yeah. water, the glass of water. Yeah, yeah, it, you blag it, it. It just works. Yeah, yeah. People thought I spoke French fluently and I didn't. Right, right. I, have, I actually have something similar in Spanish where I can copy accents so well, facial expressions and gestures that people assume my Spanish is better than it is. So oh, they yeah. hit me back with like machine gun Spanish and I'm like, no, 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 un poquito más despacio, por favor. <laughs> <laughs> because because they, they just go, oh, well, you're fluent then. And I'm like, no, I'm not. But this thing with the hand gestures and the body movements when... I'm talking to people about learning language. I always remind them like the parts of your brain that light up when you're speaking and you're speaking another language are the same ones as when you're making gestures. So language is actually physical. We learn it like this in class. Je voudrais le verre, you know, and all, yeah. but, but actually you, you move, your face moves, your throat moves, your eyes move in a French way. Yeah, and if sure. you're not doing it Frenchly, if you speak perfect French in an English way, yeah. French people understand you, but they'll be like, oof, that is ugly. And it was <laughs> trying, to, trying to speak from the throat was interesting as well. It's like, really there's a word struggle. in French called, um, which is for happiness. Go on. Which when you say it in English, you go, uh, uh, and, uh, they, uh, 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 and that's how you say it with, an, with, a, with the English tongue. Yeah, You're supposed to say, uh, 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 from, the to- from the throat. Uh, uh, and, um, they just didn't understand me. And I was like, whoa. So I had to like, someone said to me, you need to fake the accent, fake yeah. it till you make it. Yeah. So I used to have to, so when I go on holiday now, I have to go, I have to like, uh, 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 like, uh, like yes. before I start speaking to remember to speak with my throat. Yes. And then they understand you. Otherwise yes. they go, what? Yeah. This this creates a real problem for, for Westerners because it's the same with Spanish. You have to lean into the accent. But then if you go and you try and speak Cantonese, like for most Westerners, because we're trained, like with French, with German, you lean in, you lean into the accent. So then when we try and speak Cantonese, we do as Westerners, what we think is a Chinese accent. Oh, uh, yeah. And Cantonese speakers are like, you don't have to do that. You don't have to lean in. Right. So so I, I, I took me years getting my head around that because it's tonal. It's purely tonal. And, uh, so which language do you speak? Cantonese? Uh, Cantonese, yeah. Sikgong Wong Tung Wa La. 
with but siu siu. But what I would do, so what I just said is I know how to speak Cantonese. Yeah, sit gong. Sa, se, mm, look. That's it. That? Is that Cantonese? Uh it's say it again. Um I forgot what I said now. Uh, yak yi sam. Yak yi sa se mm, look. It's not, not Cantonese. It's it but it's it could be Mandarin. Could be something close. I think it's Cantonese, but maybe I'm just saying it wrong. Say it again. Say one, if two, three. If you say three. 19, it's sap cow. And if you say sap cow, it's wanker. The, well, and that's the other problem is it's it's tonal. Yeah. So so gao could be teach or gao could be molest. Or do, so, do lay. Do lay. Do lay. Do lay. I think you're speaking, man. Um, you're speaking a different tone to a different one than me. I used where, to work where, in a casino. You used to work in a casino. For a small yeah. time. Before the car wash, I, I, yeah. was, in a, I was in a casino. Well, there's, there's Singaporean months. Cantonese, there's Hong Kong Cantonese, you've got Malaysian Cantonese. So there is, there, it does, mm. it, it does, it is a little bit diverse, but they would always say to me, please don't try and sound Chinese. So don't go sick, gong, guang, tong, ma, la, because that just sounds horrible. Just say it. With a with get the tones, but say it normally. So when you actually listen, you're not leaning in. But the way we're taught for European languages, which is correct, to lean, lean in to the accent. Yeah, yeah. Heureusement, because if you go heureusement, they don't. They'll just look you like yeah, the hands. Get the hands going. <laughs> Everything. You've got to do it with the whole with the yeah. whole body. Um, so what? When I said before, like I'd be surprised. I'm not. It's not me. It's not patronizing. What what I mean is um, the rate that so the scale of somebody's vocabulary, the range of their vocabulary, and the rate at which they speak, even eye movement, is an indication for me as to what the. Because sometimes I'd be given kids and they go, oh, "This child has a behavioral issue," or "This child has yeah. dyslexia," and I'd be like, "They don't." But then then they're not cognitively. They don't have the the hardware. The brain is just not at the level where it's gonna hit these points that you're asking to hit in the education system. Mm. But with you, I'd be, I would be astounded if you didn't have the hardware for it. Yeah. It's, it's maybe just a different kind of intelligence. I think I do remember being in uni and just being like, I need to figure out how to solve this. Mm. It, it, and and I, like, this is one of the first times I experienced like anxiety was mm. in the last year mm. when I got all of the assignments in the first, in the first month back in the last year. And I was just like, 60,000 words mm. for one of them. Right. And it was like, okay, it was supposed to be 10,000 words, but then here's an example of someone who's done a, and it was showed as an example of someone who's done a 2-1 a version of that that assignment. Yeah. So outside of the boxes was 10,000 words, but then in the boxes made it up to 60,000 words. And I was like, how could I, what? And then it, yeah. was, like, it was assignment after assignment after assignment. Yeah. I remember just being at home, like breathless and just being like, how can I do this? And I was like, right, I need to break it down into small chunks. Mm. I need to have a look at this one and try and solve this and just mm. get it just over the fence. So I've got enough marks to pass mm. this one just over. The, and then I was like, right. And I was reverse engineering what I figured out. I got some help off some of the students to reverse mm. engineer what the marking criteria was and work backwards and, and mm. all this. And it was, it was properly hard. Like I was, I was struggling right until the last exam. Yeah. Um, and when I got the results, I was like, I didn't know I was going to get a two one or even yeah. pass. Right. I think you know, don't you? Because you accumulate the, the points. Yes. Yeah. You you so have a, you was, have a sense of what level you're flying along. I knew I was going to get a two one or two or two two, and I was like, I can't do a three year degree and get a two two. Mm. Like, mm. I just feel like a failure if I did that. Mm. Um, so I got the two one, and I was I was quite happy with that. Um, yeah. And then, so that was that was on twenty nine ish now. 29, you've got a degree in business, so you are literally a master of business I'm at a that master point. now. We started off this conversation, but I, know, I thought I knew everything then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, naively. So then it was, okay, so the only way to do this is a massive loan or an angel investor. At, at, at 29, is that around the age I met you? Is this? You would have met me at 28, I think, when oh, I was okay. in uni. okay, okay. Um, yes, actually, yes, that's the, that's right. You, you were would still have met me in last year at uni. So I'd yeah. started... The whole, um, um, I'd started the whole empowered brand when I was about 28, 27, mm -hmm. which was about nutrition. Mm -hmm. It was about training. It was all mostly on, mostly online because mm -hmm. I wanted a, an online company with a reoccurring income. Mm -hmm. Um, so the empowered brand came first as an online company and that's where we mm -hmm. got to meet. Mm -hmm. And it was about, empowering people mm -hmm. making people giving people the best shot at life mm -hmm. whether and using training and nutrition as a mm -hmm. as a as a gateway for that so that started off um when i was in uni 
Then when I left uni, I needed an angel investor or a big mm. loan. Mm. I tried to get a big loan, not a chance. Mm. Um, spoke to family and friends to see if I could find a... When we say big loan, do you mind saying... Because um, you wanted you wanted to open a big gym. Yeah, so I knew it would be a stepping stone. So the first gym was budgeted at about 100 grand set up. Okay. Which is... That's not this gym that you've got now. This no. is This is a smaller... Um, this gym that we've got now is... We've probably spent near on three quarters of a million, I think, in mm. total since we're beginning because yeah. we just keep reinvesting back in. Yeah. Um, so this first gym was, we managed to get a angel investor. Mm. So I'd read several angel investor books and I mm. knew what to say and how mm. to interact. And, mm. you know, uh, my intelligence was more to be able to interact with somebody who was into business now. Mm -hmm. So we're able mm -hmm. to bond on books and mm. da, 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 da. And, so basically I found an angel investor. He decided to put in 70 grand. We opened the gym. Um, within three or four months, we were just full and hit capacity. Wow. Um, that was in Morton. What was the name of that gym? Was that Empowered? Empowered Fit. Okay. So we, um, we, so it was me and um, Thea. So mm -hmm. we were 50, 50 in it. And it would, if it was, wasn't for her, it would have been a, just a bodybuilder gym. But Thea was more, it's got to be functional. Okay, talk, talk. Thea was, uh, sadly couldn't be here with us today, but she will be in a, a future interview. Uh, tell us a little bit about Thea, Thea's background and your partnership with Thea for the, for the gym. So she was um, a, she'd done a sports science degree. Mm -hmm. She was always into fitness. She um, worked in a gym, uh, managed to become like a manager. She was going around um, helping, you know, run, a, a few gyms. That's how I met Thea originally was uh, down in Neston. It was, yeah. Yeah. That So that was uh, that was great because she'd had the experience of the gym floor mm. um, and had a, she's got a real keen eye for people. Or, uh, she's great with uh, emotional intelligence. It's, it's amazing. So she's able to know what people want mm. in terms of the, uh, the, the gym floor. Mm. So she was great at that side of things and, and, and the people and then I ended up being good at the business and the marketing and the, the finances and you know all the boring stuff that goes behind up goes on mm -hmm. behind the scenes so mm -hmm. we we came together and decided we were we'd go in 50 50 um so it would have been a bodybuilder gym because mm -hmm. I didn't do anything functional at the time I was just doing bodybuilding training yeah. um I wasn't interested in like cardio I wasn't interested in being functional or fit I was just interested in you know, I want bigger muscles, man. Looking sexy. Yeah. Um, so she was like, no, it's got to have this astro area. It's mm. got to have this functional element to it. And she where fought for do... that. She fought for that. And I was right. like, if it's going to be like half of the gym is going to be taken up by this, this astro. Mm. And the gym was only 5,000 square foot. So we're actually at 22,000 square foot now. Mm -hmm. So within a few months, gyms hit capacity, classes are full. Um, the capacity was like a few hundred members because it was only small. We managed to find another angel investor who bought out the original angel investor and we moved to the current location in two units, um, which we, we we then owed this new angel investor alone. And then we decided after two years in business. You're, uh, you're in an industrial estate now, which yeah. is notoriously hard getting a gym set up. Did you have any resistance from the council for that? Um, we, we shit ourselves. Don't, don't get me wrong. Yeah. We were in the process of setting up and trying to get planning permission, which is category. Oh, you, oh, you did that simultaneously. Yeah. This is entrepreneurialism 101. Don't wait until everything's perfect. Just fucking go for it. Oh yeah. Um, ready fire aim we actually were we were actually building part of the change rooms area and the and reception area yeah. while it was in we'd already we'd already we'd already spent money and oh shit it was crazy that must have been a rather tense and then, couple of weeks yeah we got an architect which was great put a big pack together mm. went to the council mm. they put it on the board and missed the board so it had to be the next one and we mm. were like oh my god it's got another four weeks to go <laughs> so it went another four weeks bearing in mind where we're on a shoestring i'm talking yeah, like yeah. a box of screws would have to be accounted for yeah i couldn't just go and buy too many screws because we just didn't have enough money in the bank yeah so it was like 
there's four weeks down through a spanner in the works now because well, we're not going to have any members training in there, so there's not going to be anyone to pay the rent and stuff. If, if you've not lived this, this is absolute hell on earth. This is torture. Oh, people, yeah. people look at business from the outside and they go, this is easy. You just set up a gym and you run it and yeah. boom. It's the, pain. The worry it's pain. and the... The worry and the, the anxiety and the notes you're taking. And mm. I had um, f- I had f- about the size of this room, three big whiteboards mm. with all of my notes and mm. s- diagrams and brainstorms and what I'm going to do and crossing stuff off. And it was absolute, absolute crazy. So we, um, the council, went to the council meeting, me and Fia sat there. We're not allowed to speak, bear in mind, but there's mm. an audience of, say, 50 people. Mm. And we're sitting there, like, and they're going through ours. And yeah. then they started arguing. Like the council went, did between themselves. There's a right. panel of, I'm going to say, 15 to 20 deciding people deciding your fate, like it's the Spanish and we're Inquisition. Allowed, we're not allowed to speak. They've got the pack, <laughs> and it seemed like there was three or four who had a full on. He had a full on few two or three pages of notes against right. us. Like he put right. some effort into this, and yeah. he was like, "I'm not surprised." I'm not, I'm absolutely not surprised. Really? Yeah, because, well, I know other people who've tried to set up gems on industrial estates, not just here, but in other countries, in Malaysia even. Yeah. It's a nightmare. Wow, it was crazy, dude. Just, it was just dead against it. Yeah. And then there was the majority, in the end, after the bargain, which was going back and forth, hmm. the majority voted, yeah. okay, let's go to a vote. And we're like, what, already? You haven't said enough? <laughs> like, I was like literally sitting in the seat squirming. And he was yeah. like, let's have a vote. Like, who's for against? And like loads of hands went up. And yeah. I was like, oh no. Like, who's for? And she went, okay, so we're going to change it to whatever, category D, like yeah. it, it's approved. We Amazing. were like, that's it, done. It's done. <sighs> the relief. So then that means then we have the money released from the angel investor because yeah. he wasn't going to do it until we yeah of course it's, it's changed yeah. to category yeah, yeah. D, <laughs> um, and then basically we we got in there and you know some days were uh, fifteen you know twenty hours yeah um, like the astro in the astro in the in the green room yeah um, the joiners were fitting the wood underneath yeah and I did, it wasn't going to be finished in time so I had to spend pretty much overnight putting all the screws in. And you did that yourself, physically on my own. Yeah, you did that yourself. This yeah. is this is this, these are the type of stories I love. So I because could, when people when people come to me about starting up business, have been involved in a lot of startups. I'm like, you must be prepared to, to do, do everything, everything, every fucking thing. It's a multi it's a multi skill discipline where mm. you've uh, as I've been an entrepreneur, where you've got to be willing to learn everything. You've got to be willing to. Um, you know, you have a go at everything or yeah, le- yeah. know a little bit about everything because yeah, yeah. if you've got a builder coming in doing some plumbing, yeah. you need to know yeah. how much all that pipe work is, how yeah. it all fits together yeah. um, and then roughly make a charge and, and how much she charges per day and how much he charges per day and make a comparison and yeah, go, yeah. Hmm, Am I getting so if, ripped off it? <laughs> if I did that, could I do it? No, no I couldn't. Okay, yeah. right. Is it worth my time trying to learn how to do it? Probably yeah. not. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'm going to pay him to do that. Yes. And now you can go, how are you getting on? And you know the lingo, you know the words. Yeah. He's like, oh, I can't take the piss because he, he knows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you keeps, make- Keeps him honest. Then you have a good re- yeah, you have a good relationship with like the builders because they know you know. Yeah. And they can then run ideas past you and then, yeah. you know, I, I'll try everything. Mm. Um, so that's where we- I'll give you an example of the, the recent upgrade, which we'll talk about in a moment. But mm. the sound system- I was talking about it when we come in before. The sound system in we got quoted for the new gym, the upgraded mm. gym was twenty seven grand. Mm. Another company twenty three grand. Another company twenty five grand. And I was like, "Give me a list of what you're doing, and I'll see if I can, I yeah, can yeah. take some out because it's a bit too expensive for me." And I was like, "Can I buy all that myself?" Googling, yeah. Ask DJ mates, mm. where do you get your kit from? This mm. website, okay. Added it all up, and I was like, "I think I can get all that for about three or four grand." Like, okay, fitting it. Asked my DJ mates. Yeah, went on the YouTube. Yeah. Where what wire goes in what hole? Yeah, and, and realised that I just had to daisy chain all the speakers together. Yeah, said to an electrician, "Can you spend a few days with me, and we'll get up the um, scissor lift, and we'll fit the whole sound system ourselves?" Yeah, and he was like, "Yeah, if you know what you're doing, all I need to do yep. is help you unplug it in." Off we go. About a week of work in lockdown it was. So mm. we're there, speakers angling them all, mm. setting them all up, tweaking mm. them, using a little app to get the sound right for each speaker. Mm. Um, and it costs about four grand in the end. Ladies and gents, pay attention. You are not paying for products. You're paying for solutions. That's all you're paying solutions, for. Yeah. You're paying for solutions. Never think that you're paying for products. And you've got to, 
It's a different mindset rep on your head around that. I'm not surprised they were charging you 23, 25 grand for that, nor am I surprised that the actual price for the for what it was, was about four grand mm. plus then the labor. Plus then the labor. But so the labor was labor was me and yeah. an electrician. Right. Electrician, there you go, here's 150 quid a day. Right. Can you help me? Yeah, sound. Yeah. And it's done. If you're prepared to get in if you're prepared to pop the hood and get into the engine and get your hands dirty, yeah. you can do it a lot cheaper. Which is great. Or you might decide, no, that's going to be an emotionally heartbreaking experience yeah. that's going to torture me for months and I'm not going to do it. Yeah. But you, it's hard. It, first, the first thing he said that I think is hard to convey, as an entrepreneur, you understand uh, the time to value ratio. That's right, yeah. People who work for a living on a salary never understand that. Yeah. It's a nightmare working with people who've been paid for a living and they so can't get do, out of it. Just the, going on to that in a, yeah. in a moment. So yeah. now where we are, the mm. business is doing much, much better. Mm. And I will be, so how much does that cost if someone does it? Or how much does it cost if I do it? Mm. Okay, it's going to cost this much. Hmm. Okay, I'll just pay for that. Yeah. And it comes off, it's off the list like that. Mm -hmm. And you've, now your problem solving is much quicker and faster because you've got a bit of funds behind you. Mm. Dog. You've got a bit of funds behind you to be able to do make the business even better because now you're looking at the time. Yeah, I can get 10 jobs done if 10 different people work on it. Right. Quicker yeah. and make the gym a much better environment for people to train in mm -hmm. versus me trying to do every single thing myself You're trying to screw things in yourself and so i do do that still yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's like you gotta know, figure it out first it's like for example a cable maintenance mm. how long will it take me to get someone an engineer here to get a cable fixed mm. six weeks mm. okay and every time it snaps i've got a cable out of action for six weeks mm -hmm. this is not okay yeah then you're at the mercy. So of now whoever's... I'm going to learn how to fix cables. Right, right, right. So now if a cable goes, if it's out of action for more than 20, 24 hours, mm. I feel like I've failed mm. my members and failed the gym. Mm. So if it's Sunday and there's a cable gone and I'm decided to have a day off, I'll at some point go down and spend an hour doing the cable. And now I've got the cable fixed and it's done. Mm. Versus the time thing where it's six weeks. Yeah. How much value is the customer getting? They're losing a the cable. We're really, really busy. You, you've yeah. seen how busy it is. Yeah. So I'll try to I'll try to value time as well as, well, actually they need they need it fixing now. Yes. So I'll go and do it. Yes. Like yesterday I was up. So on there's a an ongoing cost in effect. The way you're thinking about it, which I think is correct, is in the system that's running in your head. You're going. There's a six week ongoing cost. To yes. This that you, that other people wouldn't factor. But a you're personal factoring personal cost in. to the yeah. members going. Ah. Yeah. Oh, can't do flies on that cable. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Is it uh, really six weeks to get machines fixed? Just more sometimes. Really? Yeah. Just, it's gyms, such, gyms must be booming now. Such though. a high demand for um, for repairs. And I've, yeah. I've tried to learn, um, me and um, the, the, the maintenance guy, Graham, we've tried to learn how to fix most things ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's... It, and then you then you're ordering parts and you're doing it yourself. Mm. So now your part delivery is only a couple of days. Right. So that's why the gym is pretty much functional all the time yes i know for a fact um most of the corporate gyms when something breaks mm. is out of action for months i know i know i know sometimes six months at a time well but. because yeah because they'll do it, they'll do their repairs and if it's branches they'll do it the the cheapest way that they possibly can and they'll have an ongoing contract with somebody and once that contract's locked in you can't Part of the contract will stipulate you can't get repair from anybody but us now. Yeah, and then it's obviously got to trickle through the layers of yeah. management to yeah. tell someone that it's broke who's got yeah, to authorise yeah. it yeah. versus I can just go, right, do that now. Yeah. Done. And this is why the NHS isn't very effective. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> too many too many layers of management to, to trickle everything through. Yeah. So where were we up to in, in your story? This so the the so you and Thea have come together, you've put you've put the gym together, you've you've physically worked on the gym itself. Then we've, so we've set up the, started set up the new gym. Yeah. We've got our planning permission. Okay. We've began to build the new gym. Yeah. Um, again, physically involved in it. I'm yeah. I'm doing, I'm sticking nail guns in the wall and I'm, yeah. I'm doing everything with the building team. Mm. One, so I know that they're doing it properly. And also I've got, um, behind all the mirrors in the gym is where the, uh, um, the, the time, cameras, the timeline is. Oh, really? So behind all the walls, each, mm. each panel in the wall was, mm. was a day. Mm-hmm. And we had a, like a 14 day countdown. So it was mm. day that we decided we were, re we were moving on this weekend. So mm. everything had to be fitted in these things. And I was going along and crossing them off with mm. the builders. Mm. So, and I was like, this needs to be done by tomorrow. So I need, because I've got the mm. Astro being fitted. I'm going to have to stay overnight. Mm. Come on guys, faster. Mm. Mm. And it was like, so we, we managed to get the, the gym ready for this particular weekend. Mm. We closed on the Friday. Um, 
in the other gym. Mm. We told all the members on social media we were closing and we were moving. And then we reopened on the Monday morning at 6 a.m. Wow. So we managed to move the whole gym, all mm. the kit, in the back of a lorry. And the members. Members come and helped. Mm. All the staff come and helped. So we just mm. lifted it all. I posted a video about it the other day, in fact, on social. Mm. I don't know if you've seen it. Showing the journey of moving it, moving everything. Mm. Got it all set up, got it all clean and tidy, and then reopened Monday morning. Mm. Um, 6 a.m. We we were there to greet everybody. Mm. And then all the members like just come flooded in. Mm. And all the new members come flooded in. And we were like... <sighs> Thank fuck. And we um we'd um been awake all weekend, mm. um two or three hours sleep per night, we're absolutely knackered, got exhausted Monday, went home, slept for two or three hours. Mm. For right, I'm gonna go back around about four o'clock and I'm gonna check the door system mm. locks and works properly because it's twenty four hours now. Mm. And this is a new thing to us. Mm. Got there, door system didn't work. Mm-hmm. Of course, why would it? Of course. You know the reason why it didn't work? Because fuck you. That's yeah. why it didn't work. So we're exhausted. <laughs> I'm on the phone to the supplier. Like, you need to, like, send someone. I've got this a 24-hour <laughs> gym and I'm, I'm narky and I'm moody and I'm tired and I've just yeah. been here the whole weekend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like, what am I going to do now? And yeah. we haven't got much money in the bank, so I can't pay someone to a security guard to stand there overnight. And I'm yeah, like, yeah. oh. And Fia's like, oh, we'll have to stay overnight, won't we? And I'm like, no, we're not staying overnight. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we did. We stayed overnight, sat in the reception. Did you really? People were flooding in. It really? All night. People were training all night. For the first yeah. night. And we yeah. were just like, wow, what have we created? This is amazing. Yeah. Um, that um, got outside and the outside was an absolute mess. If you can imagine all of mm. the, the new kit and mm. pallets everywhere. So I got the forklift truck and I spent two or three hours tidying it all up, which was mm. quite cool. Mm. We come down, come the next morning, staff come in, 6 a.m. Mm. We're like, Whew, straight back to bed and, yeah. and spent the next couple of days recovering because yeah. it was it was so good and that was us then reopened and it was what we call the white version of the gym because it was all white right and we thought it was big mm. and then um lockdown happens mm. um and we've decided that the we wanted to the the, the shareholders it was time for them to exit because yeah. there's two shareholders so we managed to get a small loan mm. um, and buy the shareholders out. Mm-hmm. So they exited at the first part of lockdown. Then I think we were, if I remember correctly, we were closed for six months, mm. whatever. And obviously that was traumatic for everybody. It was the most um, ridiculous time for, for, the, for the world. We reopened. Um, I don't know what month it was, but we reopened all the members come flooding back in. Mm. We were unsure what people were going to be like, so we prepared for everything. Mm. So we had spray bottles and cloths. I think we had about 200 spray bottles, all mm. the cloths. We had mm. masks on the side and um, hand sanitizer and screens and direction arrows. And mm. and, and uh, we were like, I don't know what everyone's going to be like because because by now I'd relaxed with the whole thing. The, this You reopened, this would have been 2021, after a year of... The lockdown, right? As I recall, twenty. Right, so let's go. Let's go back in dates then. Tw- March twenty twenty, twenty second of March twenty yeah. twenty. We shot. I think we reopened in March, April, May, June, July. I reckon July. Did we? Oh really? Were we in we the tier system then? We opened a short for a short time. We were in right. the tier system, right? And then it was. It must have been March. It must have been. It was. I looked on my phone before. So it must have been October 2020 when we decided that we weren't taking any more shit and we were going to stay closed, stay open, mm-hmm. is what happened in October. Yeah. So, so how did that... So, so you chose to stay open when there was a tier change and we were told in the Northwest, gyms must now close. Yes. So how it unfolded was, it come on the news and it was... You know the way they present all the data, mm. and I was so obsessed with watching it all the, the way time. they present the data, like screaming red images. And- yeah, so they're presenting the data, <laughs> but it was like one slide went. Here's the transmission rates, mm. and it was like universities high, thirty mm. percent, hospitality twenty five percent, restaurants nine percent, a few other things in the middle, gyms one point seven percent. So I was like, oh. 
a moment of like, wow, that's really good data. Mm. Next slide. So we'll be leaving restaurants and hospitality and things open, but closing gyms. Mm. And I was just like, show me the first slide again. <laughs> what did he just say? Yeah. And it was like, and that was it then. Yeah. The yeah. Penny, it, the, the, the penny drops. Like we're closing. And yeah. I was like, then it was told us when, and it was like two or three days time, and we mm. were like, that is that's ridiculous. Mm. Um, it was fear was more in a mood about it than me. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, we've got to follow these rules. Like, mm. Thea was like, no, we're not closing. But I was like, <laughs> I was like, we can't not close. Yeah. Like, because the police and blah, blah, and fines and- The law. The law and all this. And she was like, no, no, we're, we're not closing. Like, think about all the people that have come into the gym. Mm. What they were saying when we first reopened is they can't cope. And mm. what can't cope means is, for most, a lot of these people was suicidal thoughts, suicidal tendencies. Yeah. To because lockdown was so traumatic for them, they were locked locked away and um, lonely and social isolation. And mm. they've come, they've able to come back to the gym. And when they came back, it was like a normal environment. There was no mm. masks. Everyone was happy and friendly, and they were able to get back to their old goals. There's a little bit of relief from of the relief pain for of them, isolation. Yeah. yeah. So the gym was it was it was great for people. Mm. Um, so we were like. So Thea was like, no, I was like, we have to, right, let's just think about it, see how we feel tomorrow. Mm. Woke up in the morning and I was like, yeah, I agree, we're not closing. Mm. Like, that's just, that's just ridiculous because, uh, the, and it was literally because of the, mainly because of the mental health aspect of it. Yeah. Like, I know of 10 people that will probably kill themselves in well, the, the gym. There were um, some famous bodybuilders who draw in lot like com competitive bodybuilders who did did he yeah in, in the end yeah yeah it's um i'm connected uh with ant bales and he was uh the bodybuilder and he was he posted uh because he knew some of the lads from from yeah. competing with them and, and whatever yeah some guys they actually they just the well many many people there, there is a huge mental health crisis that it pre-existed pre the lockdowns that then was massively exacerbated unbelievable. by it yeah um I experienced my first um, post of depression at the beginning of lockdown. Mm. And I'd never gone through that before. And I just was so, I couldn't even get up and do anything. I was mm. just like, oh my God, when's this going to be over? Mm. And I was just, and it took me every ounce of knowing, like, what would I tell someone in this position? What would I tell them to do? And I'd be like, get up and move. Mm. like get out and walk the weather's nice and mm. i just sit there and and then the government said you're allowed to go out once a day for 40 minutes so it was ridiculous <laughs> so that, it's the, the soviet state of britain it's because people will be watching this from around the world and particularly i have americans following me it's hard we we humanity didn't know what lockdown meant for other countries so yeah. i was here spain bulgaria Czech and America, and we had dramatically different levels of lockdown. Czech and UK, we had the some of the strongest lockdowns in the yeah. world. Yeah, and that's that's backed by uh, research that was done at Oxford right. that compared the severity globally. Right. The United Kingdom was some of the most severe restrictions at its peak of anywhere in the world. But the point was the restrictions didn't make sense. <laughs> well, and they were yeah, changing 100%. so much that no one could understand them, and. The way they've, going back to what I said before, they closed gyms but left restaurants open. So then people felt safe in a restaurant because the, the government down. said they were they were safe in a restaurant. But it's 9% yes. transmission rate, which is quite low. It's nothing yeah. really. So you were safe. Yeah. But in a, in a gym, it was 1.7%. Yeah. Um, statistically, the numbers, I'll just pull them up now quickly. The numbers were, were, were ridiculous. Um I'll just go off memory because I can't find it. So basically, it was something like 46 cases per 500,000 gym visits across the UK. Really? I'm making a number that's, up. That, I'm that, making a number up, but I'm close. Yeah, that seems even um, strangely low, except for the fact that it's a, it's transmitted... If it's a if it's a throat to throat transmission, and most gyms are have high ceilings, so there is a lot of air movement. I think so. Yeah. If you're in a smaller room, I would expect it to be worse. And gyms are usually high ceiling rooms. But then you come back to the demographic that's in a gym. Mm. There's majority, majority of people who are looking after the health. 
Right. They're looking after the nutrition. They they have a high protein diet in ge um, in general, yes. which helps with your immune system. Yes. They're probably going to, have to be taking vitamins, which probably involves vitamin D, which mm. a lot of the studies showed was helping with uh, mm. um, you know COVID symptoms. Mm. So, is it that one they were spaced away from each other mm. and they were healthy and fitter, so they were not necessarily passing it between themselves, or mm. if they were, they didn't know because they were just fit and healthy and battering it off and asymptomatic and asymptomatic. So they, didn't, they didn't get into the statistics yeah possibly yeah. possibly um so potentially it was a case of the demographic that was in the gym was more healthier and fitter but mm. what does that tell us for the actual pandemic it tells us that it's a health pandemic not a pandemic so we should have been gym should have been treated as part of the problem sorry part of the solution not part of the problem i think because i know what kind of comments this this sort of area of the conversation will get I think what's to frame the conversation, it's worth saying wherever you stand on the general response to the pandemic, which has become such a hot issue that there are certain words I won't even use because YouTube has deleted videos of mine and given me medical misinformation strikes already. Mm. Wherever you stand on that, one thing I think I'm safe saying that was a failing was we didn't focus very much collectively in the official narrative of how to deal with this on prevention. That's right. So eat out to help out. Which and, is the opposite. And, which is the opposite. Get fatter, yeah. which we know is associated with... Get uh, fatter, sit down in a restaurant. You're not allowed to walk for more than 40 minutes. Yes. You're not allowed to do exercise in a gym. Even people the car, being... The parks are closed. The parks are closed. The, you know, the outside spaces are closed. People are being rewarded for taking the thing that I'm not going to mention with donuts in some oh, yeah. countries cheeseburgers in some countries yeah. and prostitutes in austria no seriously did you know that jacob no. you can anybody can look this up there was visits to brothels in austria of course it was austria <laughs> so go to see a prostitute if you do and it was free you could have a free and i'm like where are we like how is this an intelligent sane response to a threat donuts cheeseburgers and prostitutes where's the like you know, where's that? The em, em, let's embrace our health. Let's get mm. outside. Let's oxygenate our bloodstreams. Raise exactly. the endorphin levels. You know, and do that which would prevent. Um, that would be preventative, so that if you did get the thing, you wouldn't weigh the health service down by being very, very, very sick. Yeah, this is where the, the statistics we were throwing out. So we didn't do the, we didn't stay open lightly it wasn't just a decision mm. right let's just stay open because mental health mm. like we want to help our uh, help our members we were like looking at the evidence so we started off with the, the 1.7 percent transmission rates and then we were like well okay so that's next to nothing um it was like 0.3 um cases per hundred thousand i think for gyms mm -hmm. which is it's not we are not a danger by staying open mm -hmm. so the evidence is there mm. so when we went on the news we were we were we were saying just say you, you, you which news channel did you go on? all of the news channels yeah all. so em empowered was definitely co it was covered by bbc which is Everything. the major national network yeah and you're saying like were you world. on you were on sky and on world news as well it started off with um the first morning, so I did the video on the night before I said, and tomorrow is whatever date it was in October, we will not be closing. Mm. And then I followed up by some of the evidence, mm. you know, 1.7% transmission rates, mm. mental um, mental health, and, it, you know, people need to be healthy and fitter. So we feel like it's, it's, it's wrong to be closing gyms and mm -hmm. leaving restaurants open. Mm. Although, you know, restaurants are still a low transmission rate. So we're not against everything. We just mm. think it should be done in a more logical manner. Yeah, it should be fair and sane. Fair and sane. Yeah, exactly. So we did it in a in an evidence based in an evidence based way. Mm. Rather than just going ahead and just just doing it. So some of the statistics we th we threw out on, on the next morning, we arrived to 10, 15 different news channels outside. Wow. All parked up because we were the first business in the UK pretty much as far as I'm aware to just mm. say no. Mhm. Mm um, but we were saying no in a manner that was, you know, logical and coherent and we had a good uh, good argument. So because you stayed open during a pandemic of a highly contagious, highly dangerous disease, a bunch of journalists travelled across the country in vans together, breathing each other's air yeah. to come and interview you yeah. during the... Yeah, okay, good. None of, none of them really were bothered about 
COVID to be at all. They were no. interviewers. It was one one guy we had to. Um, I won't mention a news channel, but one guy we had to tell him to leave because he was being very rude and in my face. Really, um, very rude and in 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 other people that were being interviewed's face with his with his mic. Give me an answer. Give me an answer. And I was just like, "Whoa, get out of my face, mate!" Yeah, I'm in the middle of an interview with another channel. You don't want to name the news network. No, <laughs> <laughs> but he was a bell end. So yeah, he got lad. Had, you know who you are. You're a bell end. I had to kick him out. Um, <laughs> So it was, it was just like, like a, it was crazy. Like you see on yeah. t- on movies when the news yeah, people yeah, just, yeah. just want you. Yeah. Which was good and bad, you know. At first it was good. Okay, cool. Let's do an interview. So we'd set up and we'd do an interview. Mm. And then, you know, it goes out on the news that night mm. and he'd taken little snippets of it mm. and bastardized the whole interview. Mm. And it was not what our message was. It ended up being some little bits about money, some little bits about survival, mm. nothing about mental health, nothing about health, nothing yeah. about the low transmission rates. He took all of the important stuff out. Mm. So I was like, uh, as, a, as, a, as a group, there was a few of us involved. We were like, okay, so we do no more interviews. We only go live. So we had a switch on the second day. Mm. And we went back out to them mm. and they were all asking us questions. And I was like, right, who wants to go live? Mm. Because the interviews last night were not what we were saying. Mm. Well, can you answer this question? No, unless we're going live. Mm. And then I don't remember who it was feeling it was sky decided to come and go live with us. Ladies and gents, when you're being interviewed by the uh, mainstream media video yourself, or at least audio record yourself because the editing process, it's always a good thing to do. I've been interviewed by the BBC a couple of times and I put, I let them know. I'm like, I'm I'm recording this. Yeah. So it was, it was, it was bastardized uh, for their, their agenda or, or whatever, Mm. you know, um, it had to fit a narrative and Mm. it wasn't fitting a narrative. Right. So we managed to go live and each time we went live, it was, um, we'd have, you'll see some of the interviews if you, if you do some Googling, we had 30 seconds to a minute. Mm of a big breath mm. as they asked a question the question was irrelevant to what we were going to say because we needed to get this evidence out and mm. we needed to talk about mental health we needed to talk about you know i'm um, just looking at some notes between my legs by the way i'm not looking okay. <laughs> uh, so it was like things like 30 percent 36 percent lower heart disease by doing exercise it was 83 mm. percent lower osteoarthritis because of exercise it's lower chance of diabetes it's 30 percent less chance of death uh, early death so wait a minute. So all these things are coming from going to the gym. Mm. And then it was the statistics of how many less hospital visits there was, which is going to take the strain off the NHS. Yeah. Um, it was like, I don't know, 500,000 hospital um, doctor's appointments were reduced because of gyms. And yeah. it was all these stats we were, we were throwing out. So it would be a case of, okay, so um, the, the interviewer would be like, so don't you think you're killing people by staying open? And we'd, <laughs> and we'd go... <laughs> And trying to get your point in get all of the and he would yeah. they'd just be like what yeah. um and and then the point of the little 30 second spiel was and all we ask is for boris and the government to look at the evidence and reassess mm. the fact that they've closed gyms incorrectly yeah. and then they'd go boom and okay thank you bye and cut us off right but now we've just got it out to i think one of them was 10 million if i remember correctly i think it was the bbc we went live on it was yeah. like 10 million across the world and we've managed to get it out in a and it that we take all the presenters by surprise, and they were like, "Whoa, good!" Because it wasn't their question they were asking. Yeah. So we just kept doing it. Every it was ra- a counter ambush. Yeah, I like this. Every radio show, every everything every we could do live, we were mm. just similar spiel, but just getting out as quick as possible. Yeah, yeah. And it was about we're, we're here to, to to help. We're not here. Yeah. We're not staying open because of money or survival. Yeah. Like at this point, I'm staying here. I'm staying open because we've got people who are potentially going to commit suicide if I close my gym. Mm. Like, that's terrible. Like, Mm. the pain and the suffering that a person is going through Mm. to want to take their own life just made me feel physically sick to the Mm. point where I can do something about this and I can Mm. let them come in the gym tomorrow. So what was the the state's reasonable response to you wanting to keep gyms open to keep people healthy and to help with their depression and suicidal ideation? States. The state, the government. What was the government's response to that? Zero, nothing. Mm. Um, the only, we got no, absolutely nothing back mm. apart from we were that hard with all the news channels for seven days in a row. Mm. Um, the what, Whoever was making a decision at the time um, was, uh, he was in a, he was in a, 
the parliament and we were able to watch it live and we just mm. sat there watching it waiting for something to happen mm. and we'd also hit all of the mps mm. so all the mps had traveled to, to london to sit mm. and all of the questions were coming from, it was all about gyms mm. every single mp we'd hit we'd we'd had we'd had zoom calls it was many it was like non-stop for for one week all these MPs are then talking, asking questions about why you're closing gyms when gyms are going to help and why are you closing gyms when it's, you know, the people are going to get healthier and fitter, which is going to combat. And all these questions were going at the government. And there was no, almost next to no response. And it was like, this is a decision we've made. And, you know, we've looked at the evidence. And then one day, seven days in, which was the next Monday, mm. um, one of, the, um, one of the, uh, the health minister, I think it was, turned around and went, Okay, well, we'll have a talk about that offline uh, and we'll look at reopening gyms. Mm. And then it came up on the government website. It wasn't even, there was no response. It just came up on the website. Gyms are now back open in tier three. That was Interesting. It. Done. And we were just like, oh, so we've done it now. Mm. So we were back open again. Mm. Um, the We had a 90, I'm going to say 99% positive um, emails and phone calls. The phone didn't stop at reception. Mm. Everyone was ringing and email and supporting our, our our mission, supporting mm. what we were doing. And we had the odd person who was against us. We got a few um, like one star reviews and saying that we were we were killing people by staying open. And I saw, I saw some of those on Google. Yeah, um, which is fine. Um, why I, do you hate people so much, Chris? Why yeah. do you want people to die? It's crazy. That's why it? I brought you in today to ask you that question. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> The funny thing is, it's completely, completely the opposite, isn't it? I'm going, well, well, people are going to be healthier by coming to the gym and eating healthier. Mm. So they've got a higher chance of um, having a better lung capacity and a better fitness to be able to probably get over COVID if they get it. At what point did they send the police to you to, to close the gym? Um, every day. Every day they sent the police yeah. down. And what, what did you tell the police? So day one, um, the police were very supportive. They were like, we understand that mm. we, we've we watched you on the news and we understand mm. what you're doing. Mm. Um, and I took the um, point of not letting them in because it was a member establishment. Mm. Uh, you see on the screen up there. So I'd, I'd, I'd not let them in because I was like, it's a membership establishment. I don't want to, mm. uh, you know, get the people that are inside in trouble. Yeah. So they at first didn't come in. They, were, okay. they, they didn't have the right to come in. Yeah. Um, and they were very nice. They were very friendly. They understood what we were doing. We were polite. We were explaining our situation and, and why I was doing it. Mm. Um, we took uh, several warnings in the first few days. Mm. I think on the screen there's Thea's taking her. Are they polite in this video? Yes. J Jacob, could you turn the sound up on this video? We'll yeah. just hear a, like 15 seconds of it. Thank you, mate. How many gyms have you been around now? All of them. 70. 70. 70. Okay. So so this is was this on the first day this uh, is early this is still quite this friendly is early, yeah this yeah. is it was friendly the whole time oh was it really um, yeah it was friendly even to the point where they turned up at um a gym down the road um body tech with with armed police they turned up with armed police but and they were they friendly. still friendly with uh, guns with guns for the amazing threat of keeping a gym open yeah men with machine guns Ex special forces dudes who got into the police <laughs> yeah. turned up. Did they find anyone there to shoot? Um, they didn't shoot anybody. No. Oh, that's good. I'm glad to know yeah. they didn't shoot anybody for keeping a gym open. It's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> so, so that that and that's your that's your mate. That's a, an associate yeah. of, of of empowered. Yeah. So he was uh, he was open. There was there was a lot of gyms that stayed open on that on that day as well. Some of them, in fact, most of them weren't vocal about it, whereas we were just vocal about it. So the police were all coming to us. So several times a day, the police would come and warning, 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 fine, mm. fine, fine. Mm. So we got fines mm. um, and it was getting, it was only, luckily it was only seven days. Yeah. So to, to the point, we only stayed open for these seven days mm. and that's the only time we stayed open during the entire pandemic. 
Right. So we weren't staying open when there was a national lockdown. Right. We were actually closed. So what happened from this moment is we, the next lockdown, we had a police visit several mm. times a day again. Yeah. But we were doing building work and there was no gym equipment inside. Okay. So they were just coming in every single day and just walking around and making sure that we were not open. And okay. But this was just obviously the general public complaining about us still thinking we were open, I think. When you weren't. Because they'd come every day and said, we've had a call. And I'd be like, oh, okay, come in. And they'd yeah. just be friendly again. Yeah. Um, so the experience of them coming to visit us was not hostile. It was very friendly. Which is good. Um, and it's the, it's the right way to, to be with the police, I think, as but we far were as also, possible. But we were friendly. also very, we can hear us laughing in the video. We were, mm. we were, we were just being completely normal with us as, yeah. as we are now. We, we weren't hostile. Um, they weren't hostile. And it was, you know, we know we're... You, we were explaining, you can, you can hear Theo explaining the statistics in there. Mm. And they were like, well, we're just doing our job. And I was like, we were like, well, we're just kind of doing our job. Mm. And, you know, we've got to come to a discussion and we, we get fines. We are just doing our job. <clears throat> we're just doing we're our just job. Just following orders. <laughs> so uh, exactly that. So yeah, it was, it was, it was interesting. Yeah. Um, and after the, as I say, after the seven days, we were never allowed to be open again in tier three. Right. And we were then put into tier three rather than closure. And what, what would you estimate was your impact on that decision to let the gym stay open? Um, I it's think... Like it wasn't just you. What You weren't the only gym doing it, but you were spearheading the, the, that. I think... Um, I don't... I, I, I think we posted on social media the next week how many people were allowed to go... How many millions of people were allowed to now go to gym. Mm. And it was... It, it, it was good... A lot of number it felt good, and I'm mm. pretty sure we would have still been shut for the whole entire lockdown period yeah. if we hadn't done what we'd done, right? Which would have then affected the health of the country, it would have affected the mental health of the country, it would have yeah. affected um, so many things, yeah. and it would have it would have had a bigger impact on the NHS because people wouldn't be able to continue to be healthy and fitter. Yes. So I feel it was a good thing we did. Um, Obviously, I've got no regrets for it. Mm. Um, we had to pay our fines. Uh, our fines weren't weren't massive. Mm. So our fines weren't massive because we weren't prolonging the staying open in the second lockdown. So when it became national lockdown again, mm. we were okay, we're closed. Because, because it's now it's everybody. Lockdown. Yeah, It wasn't, we're being singled out and you, you, the government hadn't made a mistake. Mm. So in this particular week, the government had made a mistake. Mm. They would closed the wrong businesses. Yeah. So you know, later on we closed. Yeah. So all of the news, we kind of, that's the only time we were in the news. Obviously later on in the next lockdown, mm. everyone then started following suit and trying to stay open mm. and they were getting prohibition notices and, mm. you know, 50,000 pound fines and, and wrecking, wow. wrecking mm. businesses across the UK. Mm. And the point being is we stayed open because there was a governmental mistake on that particular point. Yes. Not the lockdown. You weren't just in pure defiance of no. lockdown. Totally. So we were never against the lockdown or never against the COVID. Um, whether I believe it was a good idea or not is a different matter. And you're not saying anything crazy like, oh, the virus doesn't exist. Or Didn't do anything like that. Nothing and like that. Was, that. that was not, not, we weren't saying that at all for mm. the entire time. Mm. We were just going, simple, simple when we do our nutrition stuff and when we do our training stuff, mm. the evidence is incorrect. Yes. What is the evidence saying? Yes. The evidence is saying we should be open. Yes. So let's, Let's tell people, let's tell the government, let's tell the newspapers. Yeah. Uh, and it worked. So we got it over the fence and, you know. We you, were, you were fair and sane, but defiant, and you were given a fair and sane response in yes. the end. Yeah. Um, and that was, the, um, that, was the, that was the end of that. We were locked down again in January the 5th, I think, mm. 2021. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. I, was, I wasn't, I was in check in lockdown yeah. for that. And we we would we were attending a gym um, where if the police van came by, it was it was an illegal gym. They turned off all the lights and we lay on the floor, and, <laughs> and I'll live with that experience for the rest of my life. <laughs> we we lay on the floor and giggled, yeah, <laughs> like children. It was weird as fuck. <laughs> yeah. Well, some things happen like that during that week. Yeah. Of course. I, I mean, all over the place as Jim, as, 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 as those people doing it. I'm aware of it. We've actually nearly gone for two hours. It's been very, very easy talking to you. Um, we'll definitely have to do this again. We've got about eight minutes left. I wanted to ask you more specifically about what you feel about the, the impacts are of training in the gym 
and people's mental health. How important do you think physically training is to people who have mental health issues? Um, I think the relationship between training and mental health is is massive. Um, people get a sense of purpose. So mm. they get a sense of, I'm going to go up in the morning, I'm going to train. Mm. There's one. They get a sense of progression. And, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the main the main characteristics of human nature is to progress and to yes. live and to survive. Yes. So they get that from the gym. Mm. So whether that's an extra rep on their training or yeah. becoming a little bit fitter, they get an, a sense of progress. Mm. So they're the two, the two main things. Now they've got goals to hit. Mm. Again, progress. Mm. So they've got some goals to hit gym, whether it's the training, whether it's the nutrition, whether it's fat loss, whether it's health, whether mm. it's being able to be stronger, to get off the toilet when they're older. Yeah. Simple things. So they've got these, these, these big pillars of, 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 na of human nature, which is going to help with mental health naturally. Mm. Um, then for me and a lot of people getting rid of my ADHD energy. Yes. So I, I, I would be, I don't think I would be as happy as I am if I wasn't able to just release this ADHD energy by going to the gym. I don't I know what I would do if I didn't go to the gym. Oh, be terrible. I, right? I, would, I would be unbearable, even more insufferable than I am. <laughs> yeah. So there's some of the mental aspects of it. Yeah. But then you've got the body aspects where the body releases serotonin and dopamine. Mm. So I don't remember in 20 years of going to the gym and training, ever leaving the gym and f having a bad session and feeling down. Mm. You feel elevated. You feel... You feel good. You've got the serotonin going around your body. Mm. You've got dopamine going around your body. So you feel good from that training session. And mm. then that's going to help you with the rest of your life naturally. Um, so I think, you know, if we if we exercise, ex exercise equals medicine as well. Mm -hmm. So most ailments and most illnesses, exercise is going to help you be, you know, get rid of that illness. Yes. So I think it's really important to combine the mental health, the mental health and the physical health mm -hmm. and understand that, you know, gyms, gyms are going to help you live longer, live happier, um, live stronger, live fitter mm. and, you know, overall have less, less illness. Yeah. So why wouldn't you go to the gym or do some sort of activity? It doesn't have to be the gym. Mm. So I feel like one of my purposes in life is to help people be, be more active. Yeah. And because I own a gym and like the gym, I want people to come to the gym. Yeah. Come and train. Come and see what it's about. And we've set up a gym. Obviously, that will is a little bit different than other gyms you've been there. It's mm. not a poser gym. It's a family gym. With it's a poser gym when I'm in there, mate. <laughs> in your corner. <laughs> Flexing in front of the mirror in the corner, yeah. But it's not there really, is no, it? No, no. It's it's a very friendly, very warm atmosphere gym. There's no there's no silly attitudes in there. It's really nice. it's a really nice friendly atmosphere. Yeah. So then on top of all that body and mind stuff, mm. you've got a community there. Yeah. So you can lean on people. We've got the cafe in the entrance for mm. people to then have chats and mm. you know there's there's some serious like conversations go on in that cafe where yeah, people yeah. need that conversation and need that sense of community. Yes. And I mean then you've got the little micro communities within the gym. Yeah. You know some people might do Olympic lifting, some people might do bodybuilding training, some people might do CrossFit, mm. and you've got all these different aspects. Um, all in one place and that's mm. why we decided to put all the, the equipment as we have which is um, you know it's we've called it a gym fit for all yeah. so you can do whatever training you want yeah boxing crossfit bodybuilding yeah cardio yeah so I think I think all that combined is what I'm trying to say mm. Mm. and do, are you aware of do you have people who are going to the gym who have mental health issues a, a is, lot yeah yeah so there's actual clients, there's customers yeah. that you know this person is, is here because of... I would go as far as saying the majority. I've wondered that, you know, in your mm. gym, just by looking at people, um, because obviously I'm I'm a nutter, uh, which is why I do what I do. And um, I'm like, I have to be in here. Yeah. And I, there's a certain sort of intensity. And uh, you said a, a task, task fixation, I think you said before, a task focusedness and related to ADHD yeah. that... I think you can detect in other people. Mm. Um, and at that intensity, I think you can detect. So I, I have wondered with your gym, if it's a lot of it is about mental health. And we have, um, strangely, 80% attendance. Now, That's unheard of for Statistically, a gym. Mm. the gym industry has 80% non-attendance. Yes, it's usually 20% attendance. So when I, was in, when I was in uni, I was relying on 80% non-attendance to yeah. make, the, make the model work. And we yeah. actually have the opposite. <laughs> Which means more cleaning, which means more toilet flushes. You have to which... tell your customers they're not using the gym. For... Follow the statistics. Yeah, but you know what's great about that? Yeah. We get to know everybody. Yeah, yeah. Because they're there all the time. Yeah. They're there yeah. 
three to five days a week and yeah. you get to i get to know people by the name and i know uh, you know so many people and it's great and but that then, means that, that then also, they all they all know each other they all know each other that means you don't you not only do you not have posers in your gym but you actually have people who are fairly serious about training 80 mm. percent attendance is just unheard it's unbelievable of. Yeah. unbelievable and i um you know i'm obviously proud as a as a collective there's the staff to maybe to be able to create that environment for people mm. make it feel comfortable mm. make everyone who comes to gym our goal is to make them feel comfortable make mm -hmm. them enjoy the environment not be you know know that they're not going to be looked at and you don't have to feel insecure because someone will be like are you okay yeah do you want a hand yeah um members will help other members yeah but also the staff are there on hand to go do you know how to use that machine here i'll show yeah. you um or how's your day how's your training mm. and how you feeling and that is the big part of the the gym is is to make everyone feel comfortable and enjoy the enjoy the experience. Wonderful. What's uh, the future for you and Thea and Empowered Fit? What do you see happening over the next couple of years? Um, we're just about to go back to our roots, which is uh, helping people. Mm. So we're just about to create um, an app for active members. So the app will then tell show people what to do. Mm. So I've started doing some videos on how to use the machines, mm. how to train, and, and things like that program them so they know what to do so as a, like a member perk they're going to get access to this uh, this app which will mm. give them training plans and programs and help them with nutrition and and um, we'll add some uh, mindset stuff in there um and then if we're looking at charging it out to non-members so we can expand online yeah. a little bit more because we've got a lot of people who want to come to our gym but they live too far away yes um other gyms in the future possibly but i really want to make sure that we're able to keep a grip on the, um, being there and being present mm. because a big part of it is that we're involved in the day-to-day -day life of the gym. Yes. And if you go corporate and you have, you know, some of the corporate gyms, I've just got a guy sitting behind the desk who owns it. Yeah. That's not where I want to be. I want to be on the gym floor, mm. know people, you know, and that's our main thing. So I'm not sure if there's going to be more gyms. Yeah. Definitely going back to our roots now we've settled which is back to helping people mm. with their training and their nutrition awesome awesome i love it where can people uh follow what you're doing and, and what you're doing with the gym so instagram i uh, just opened a tiktok as well so they're both uh you be doing some dances on there come I'm on trying not to come on mate i might be forced to i'll do one with you do a dance with me, yeah. Imagine that crossover. I've got loads of, I've got like 70,000 TikTok followers. They'd love to see me and you do a little dance, yeah. lad. In a, in a, are you going to put a bodyboarder fang on? No. <laughs> <laughs> that's, for, that's for my OnlyFans account. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's, I think it's at Empowered Fit Gym. I think I did on tick, on, on uh, Empowered Fit dot will mm. um, for the gym, for, for Instagram. And then it's Empowered Fit on, on TikTok. And then my Instagram is empowered Chris, just one word, no no hyphens or anything. Mine is. Yeah. Jacob's on it, man. He doesn't right. miss a trick. Oh, it there, Nice. There we go. All the way in. Love so that's stuff. mine. And then the gym one is, um, can you bring the gym one up? Is it empowered fit dot will? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Empowered fit dot will. Lovely stuff. So that's our main ones. And obviously we're on Facebook and we're on Google and whatever. But yeah, it's been nice talking to you. Thanks Love for the you. invite. Chris, thank you so much for coming in, mate. I really appreciate it. Ladies and gents, um, I am Richard Grannon. This is Liverpool Podcast Studios. If you're thinking of doing a podcast in Liverpool or Wirral area, make sure you come here. Jacob does everything. The sound, the visuals, the editing afterwards. It's really beautiful. I highly recommend it. There you go, Jacob, mate. Um, thanks for coming in today. And... If I can interview again with you and Thea yeah, in about amazing, a month yeah. or so's time, that would be awesome, yeah. Cool. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time and for your attention, and we look forward to speaking to you again soon. Cheers.